important projects. Our first speaker today is Adam Harvey, who will be talking about uh, visualising scientific data with HTML5, but I think first up he wants to uh, give a reminder to anyone to uh, go to a web address and give away your personal details. Uh, and it's a redirect address, so you can trust him. <laughs> uh, and the, the only interesting part from his made-up bio is the fact that his mother, uh, well, Adam Harvey's mother uh, referred to him as an unshaven, unkempt mess with terrible hair. Whereas for me, I got the same description, but from my wife. So uh, <laughs> without further ado, Adam Harvey, thank you. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Good morning everyone. So, before we actually get started properly, I need to gather some data because I need it for a demo later on. As I said to the people who were here early, I'm doing a live demo with user submitted data in a session. Clearly I've lost my marbles. So, go to this address and enter where you're staying in Brisbane. Now, if it's not one of the preset options on the right hand side, just be very generic. You know, just pick a suburb or something like that. We don't, we don't necessarily need sort of bedroom level detail here, but um, if you could do that, um, that would be really, really good please so there's your address I'll just give you a few seconds to memorize it it is very long Make sure it's a capital K. It, uh, yes sorry it does need to be a capital K um, yeah. <laughs> which is also fun but probably not quite what you're after okay is everyone good sweet so as I was saying and as Peter was saying, I'm Adam Harvey, and this is a very inaccurately named talk. Because HTML5, of course, no longer really has a 5 in the title. Thank you, W3C. Of course, I'm lying to you anyway. When I say HTML5, what I really mean is HTML plus JavaScript plus CSS plus SVG plus various other technologies. So it's not particularly HTML5 as such, but since everybody else seems to like using it as a buzzword, I'm going to use it as a buzzword as well. You all know that. Your first problem, of course, is that you have data. Am I still on? Reams and reams of data. And you want to be able to visualize it somehow, which makes complete sense. The problem is that you have data in a lot of different formats. This was a very this was a subset of what I had to deal with in the last 12 months. Um, there are, in fact, more mentions of XML further down with different words. Um, basically, I mean, you can see there that you've got the problem immediately that a lot of these things aren't going to talk very nicely in a web context, which is unfortunate because the web happens to be where an awful lot of data exchange happens these days. You've also got the problem that a lot of these formats are not very well supported across platform. So, I mean, for example, Access. What a lovely format that is. What a, what a brilliant database system. But if all you want to do is dump some data somewhere, it happens to be easy enough for people to use. The only one on that list that I think is actually useful when you want to do this sort of thing is CSV. Ow! <laughs> I should have rehearsed that. The XML ones aren't so bad if you can figure out what they actually mean, but... Um, you do have that small problem that you have to figure out what they actually mean. My favourite on this list are the fixed width text files which are not fixed width because some of the fields have overflowed and they've just used printf. So, if in doubt, get it into a database. I'm not going to evangelise any particular database. Realistically, if it's something you can connect to from your chosen pro server-side programming environment, great. That's really all you need. The good thing is, if you can get your data into CSV, which most of those formats I mentioned you can with various tools, then you're pretty much golden at that point because you basically have the ability with most modern languages, PHP and Python are the, uh, the examples up there, but there are plenty of others, to natively pull out that data and slurp it in wherever it makes sense or output JSON or do whatever it is you actually want to do with it. If you have some sort of weird arbitrary database, access, um, then ODBC and an appropriate connector is often your friend in that regard. As I said, CSV is easy and interoperable. It's completely non-standard, of course, and you'll spend hours sometimes figuring out what the appropriate combination of quoting and escaping characters are, but you will at least get there in the end. So to serve it up, 
JSON, of course, is incredibly widely supported these days. It is effectively the de facto standard at this point for getting data to and from a server on, in, over HTTP. There are, of course, good reasons for this. It's somewhat less bloated than XML. You actually stand a chance of reading it. Um, and it's quite lightweight. Small data sets, of course, you can embed straight into your web pages. There's no particular need to necessarily have a server side. So if you've got a small data set, forget about writing PHP or Python if you're a you know, reasonable, reasonable web developer. Just do it all in JavaScript. If you've got larger data sets, then you need to look at lazy loading. But that's often pretty simple. You, you don't tend to need to do much more than just ask for a particular bit of data, slurp it out, spit it back in JSON. Most of the demos I'm actually doing here are doing neither of those because, as I've already mentioned, I'm lying to you. So what I'm doing in most of these is actually I've got static JSON that I'm loading up via XML HTTP request. That also actually works, but I probably wouldn't recommend it in practice. All right, so the way I'm going to structure this is I'm, I'm really only going to give you a taste of some of the options that are out there. 20 minutes really isn't long enough to exhaustively go through the options. It's not even really long enough to summarize the options. So I've picked a couple of interesting libraries and written some demos, and I'm going to walk you through some of the interesting bits of code that actually have generated the, these demos. Or at least I think they're interesting. You may think they're interesting. So the first, the first library I'm going to talk about is the JavaScript InfoViz toolkit. Who here has used it, seen it? OK, a few of you. Well, that's good. I won't be boring most of you then. Slightly unfortunate acronym, as it turns out. It's not terribly easy to Google for unless you use the full name, which is unfortunately quite long. It is basically a way of visualizing mostly tree and graph data. You also, it can do some charts as well. It has a wide variety of output formats, and they've really improved in the last 12 months. The website, which I should have linked if I'd been thinking about this, um, which is the jit.org, um, Google it, um, has a very nice demo gallery which shows you the range of things that you can actually get out of this library and it's really, really useful. So you have a whole bunch of trees and graphs and space maps and all sorts of things that are actually really, really handy and which you can interact with quite well. It also works with IE. Now it uses Canvas for doing the drawing but it also bundles X Canvas and makes sure that it uses the subset of Canvas that X Canvas supports and it all works really, really nicely. The only problem is that if you're doing lots of animation, as I discovered last year, um, and one of your target users is running IE6, um, it's kind of slow. Actually, really slow, like sort of one frame per second slow. But um, it, still, it still works pretty well. So let's get into a demo, and then I'll show you some of the code behind it. Live demo time. This ought to be good. All right, so I've loaded up a data set here, which is basically a subset of the uh, distribution timeline. So this is just the Debian section of it. This is effectively just a map, or a graph, sorry, which just basically just funnels out all the direct derivatives of Debian, the indirect derivatives via, say, Ubuntu or Nopix, and continues on out from there. And if I'd spent a bit more time on this, I might have actually pruned some of those. So this is actually interactive, and this is really where the JavaScript InfoViz toolkit comes into its own, is the way you can actually interact with it. So if I click on that. Now, this is out of the box. I've done nothing to make this work, basically. Well, I have, but very little, really. So you can see here, it just goes all over the place. Let's maybe go a couple of levels at once. It's pretty cute, and it looks pretty good. And people actually seem to grok it, which is really, really handy. It's a very good way of presenting this sort of hierarchical data to potentially a lay audience. You know, when you're presenting to maybe your supervisor's supervisor's supervisor who isn't actually interested in your project but is actually giving you money, then this is the sort of thing that actually comes in really, really handy. All right, so how do we build this? As I said, this is just static JSON. So that's the format it's in. Now this came as a CSV file, and if I had more time I'd show you how I did the transform, but it's not that complicated really. It's just slurped in the CSV file, built up a JSON structure. I use PHP, but you can use Python, whatever. Um, and then spat out JSON out the other end. Really nothing to it. Some of those children obviously have children of their own. Now the actual code to build this, I'm actually going to show you the whole thing, including boilerplate. So. Well, almost the whole thing. 
this missing little window on load, but everything else. So this is actually how we built it. So it's the HyperTree module that we're using. We're injecting it into the container. We'll just make it the size of the window. So we have to tell it how to create labels. Um, this is a slightly unfortunate bit of boilerplate that we have to write because in practice you really actually tend to want the labels to look the same, but there you go. The only thing I've had to do to basically make the visualisation work is that line there. So we've got a click handler on the labels and then from there we just call the appropriate method within the toolkit and it does all the animation and basically reparents it for you. We also have this here which actually places the labels. Again, I'm not entirely sure why you wouldn't actually have a default implementation of this, but you don't. So, But it's going to end up looking something very similar to this. That's it. So that's how you define the object. You call those two methods, you're done. Happy days, go on with your life. So that was four slides about, what was that, about 20 lines of code, and you had that visualisation. All of the, pretty much all of the toolkits chart types are basically that simple to use. I'm also going to show you an extra bonus demo. I'm not going to show you the code for this, but basically, just to give you an idea of the breadth of what you can actually do with it, here's something completely different. This is a very ugly, because I only did it yesterday, browser share chart over the last year. The bit I like is that IE has dropped below 50%. <laughs> Now this is, again, this is the same toolkit, but this is obviously a different visualisation. And again, you've got, you can interact with it. So we've got little hover handlers there. So IE is down to 46%, Firefox is 30.7, Chrome's really increased. So Chrome earlier in the year was 7.2, now 13, now 14. And you can see all of that at a glance. And this allows you to basically have a nice interactive chart very, very cheaply. The amount of code that went into this is about the same as what you just saw for the HyperTree. It's, it's really quite simple. Okay, so that's the JavaScript InfoViz toolkit. Now, the other library I'm going to talk about at a little bit of length is Raphael. Who here is familiar with Raphael? Okay, about the same number, but a different number. That's good. Raphael is a vector drawing library. It's actually written by an Australian, who I really hope isn't here, um, it, or ever sees this talk. Um, it generate, the reason why it's cool is because you can use it like SVG. The, the interface is very similar to the concepts in SVG. Your prim drawing primitives are basically the same. But it will also generate VML as well, which is handy in Internet Explorer. Hopefully IE9 will take over the world, at least on Windows, and this will deal with this problem. But for the time being, if you actually want IE users to see it, and unfortunately all the people who are in control of the purse strings at my university run IE, then that's basically what you're going to need to give them. So, why would you use it when HTML5 gives you this lovely canvas element, which also has drawing primitives, which also works quite well? Because Raphael gives you event handlers and unified event handlers at that across all the quirks of the various browsers and God knows there are a lot of them. So it's very similar as you can see to really most of the major JavaScript libraries. So there's a click method, you give it a callback, it does stuff. This is pretty handy. That's actual code from the demo which I will now show you. Now I'm not going to bore you terribly with the details of this but basically, gee I wish this projector was brighter, basically all right, you don't need to see me for a minute or two anyway. <laughs> Success. Okay, so what this is, this is the Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene. I work in genetics. Um, and what this is, is this is every exon in the gene, and I'm not going to bore you with what an exon is. Basically, with the number of variations in that gene, for each exon, or the percentage of variations in that gene for each exon. And what this demonstrates is that you've got certain hotspots, and these variations are in patients who are suffering from a form of muscular dystrophy, usually Duchenne, but sometimes Becker. So you can see here that there are some hotspots that we've immediately been able to see. So let's interact with this. I've got some handlers on this. So let's have a look at exon 14, which is a nice bright one. So I click on that, Exxon 14 has 191 listed variants in 102 base pairs, which is a hell of a lot. So you can see there, I mean, this is a very simple piece of code, and again, I'll show you most of the code in a minute. But it's, I like it, you know, it's got little bits of interactivity and, you know, it's sort of animated and kind of pretty. 
All right, let me figure out how to turn these lights back on again. Right, okay. So, how have we built this? Again, we have a data set, which is just straight up JSON. We have some code, which basically here, so we're just starting the Raphael element, so again, it just needs a container to draw into in HTML. That gives you a drawing canvas, if you like. So we'll draw the actual box, which is what you just saw, which is, just goes across the whole screen. Then we'll draw the individual X on rectangles. I'm not going, I'm going to skip through this quite quickly because I'm quite crunched for time, but you basically get the idea. We've got a little animation handler there, so we've got our hover handlers to do the highlight effect. Okay, and that was basically what you saw. There is a little bit of boilerplate there, but the code is actually pretty straightforward. And you can click on the demo links in my slides and this will actually come up. So you can have a look at the code in full. Please don't judge me, I wrote most of it about two o'clock in the morning. After beers. Okay, so you've got various options. I've only touched on a couple, there are plenty more out there. How do you really put it all together though in the end? You know, you've got this data, you need people to see it, and you want them to see it in a rich way. Cheat. There are a ton of good services out there. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't actually get much time at work to make things pretty. You know, I, it's all about the data, data in, data out. But making it pretty is actually important. It, it's what gets you grant money, it's what keeps people interested, it's what will fire people up at conferences, hopefully. So, you don't really have the time to do all of this, so use the services when they're available. A good example of this is mapping. Now, mapping, I hope Daniel Nadasi's not in the room. Mapping is not terribly hard. <laughs> I mean, it is, but it's not, it's, it's not rocket science. You know, you, you have data, it's usually in some sort of form that you can draw in a vector form. You could invent your own mapping system, you know, plenty of people have done it. Some of them even did a good job. But why would you bother? I mean, you've got Google Maps, which has an interesting API, but it's quite functional. Uh, Bing Maps, which has a much friendlier API, but it's much less functional and also kind of evil. OpenStreetMap, which of course has the advantage that your underlying data is free, so if you're doing some sort of Creative Commons licensing, that can be really handy. So don't write your own. If there's something that's already out there, even if it's a, you know, a web service, use it, I say. I, I don't see any point. Google, you know, Google Charts would be another good example of that. Don't, don't reinvent the wheel. If you need a static chart, don't sit down with JP Graph and write something. Use Google Charts. Move on with your life. So, earlier on, I had you all basically give me your personal details. I hope you all entered locations because otherwise that's the data set. All right, let's see how this went. So, what I've done here is a Google Maps visualization. Now, I use Google Maps, not OpenStreetMap, basically for time reasons. I already knew the API. That really isn't where it was meant to go. <laughs> That's actually pretty entertaining. Thank you, whoever did that. There we go, okay. So, Brisbane, Briz Vegas. So you can see here, we've just got markers at the moment. We're using the clustering library that you can get from the uh, Google Maps Util library. Yes, I know, I'm running out of time. Um, you can see that we've got 28 in Brisbane proper. Let's maybe zoom in a little bit more. Yeah, so we've got plenty of people staying at Urbanest, and I'd say the marks in there as well. And then we've got people sort of dotted around the place as we go. Now that's by itself reasonably okay, but I think we can do better or at least I hope we can do better, the person who's put in South Australia might have just mucked this up. It's not very html 5 -y though. Of course, very few things are html 5 -y these days. So let's actually do something more on the client side than just setting markers. Okay, now a lot of the time, you really want to draw some sort of heat map over the top or something like that. So, ordinarily you do that on the server, but that requires a lot of resources. Now, where I work, we have one server that hosts most of our visualization and most of our projects. It's kind of overloaded, and the last thing it needs is for people like me to blunder in with a map like that and have it generate 40 tiles of a heat map every single time I scroll around. Because funnily enough, that results in the load average spiking, a sysadmin getting paged, and my email mysteriously disappearing from my account. So, what we need to do instead, is just get the data, it's all about the data, and then draw it on the client side. 
So we'll draw an overlay on the client side. A tile server would be better, but it's trickier to get working on the client side. And I know this because I spent about four hours on this last night. Um, you, it's easier on the server side because Google Maps is just set up that way. But we'll use an overlay for now. We'll use Canvas to do the heat map colouring. In actual fact, we're using Canvas to do, to do the drawing as well. So this is a very, very potted version of the code you're about to see in action. So basically, we have some data, which is a set of coordinates, nothing more. We will do some boilerplate to get it into the form that Google Maps expects. We will draw ra transparent radial gradients, basically, to get an intensity, which we will then go through, get the image data out of the canvas, and we will colorize. How, we, how are we going to colorize it? We're going to go through, normalize the data so that we actually know where our bounds are. We're not using an absolute scale here. There's no, there's no need. A heat map's really all about just seeing where the heat actually is. We've got a heat gradient, which I will not bore you with the details of, and then we just go through pixel by pixel and just colorize as appropriate if we need to. All right, let's see if this actually works. I'm not terribly confident about this after seeing the earlier one. You see my point. <laughs> I think I've just destroyed my browser. Decidedly interesting. Ah, here we go. I was just having a good think about it. Now, I'm about to spike my CPU because it's about to do the drawing and colouring, which unfortunately is going to be fairly painful, I think, now with the size of that data set. Actually, let's see if I can forestall that. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Adelaide person. So, you can see there that we have basically, we have a small dark spot in Adelaide. Funny, I've often said that. <laughs> and then we have a big hot spot in Brisbane. And I'm out of time, but if you come and see me later, I will just get rid of that Adelaide one and zoom in some more and actually show you what that looks like properly because... All right. Come on. You can see the same chugs having to do more and more data. But you can see even on this that there is a hot spot around the CBD. We've got people scattered around the suburbs, mostly in the north. It gives us a good idea of the distribution of our delegates straight away. And you can see it at a glance. This is not the greatest set of demos in the world, but hopefully it will inspire you to think about what you can actually do with HTML5. Go forth. Um, there's time for about one question. Just, um, can our next speaker just, uh, can our speakers switch I'll over while I take another question?